back in 1889, her regiment was born, and her mounted troopers rode in sunshine and in storm from Betuana land to the mighty Zambezi. Known by many names, she was the BSAP. Come ye troopers of old, wherever ye may be, drink a century toast to the BSAP, and we'll sing a couple of bars of the good old Kamakai song to the BSAP, and the regiment lives on. Has served in war and peace, had glory and has bled. A multi sided role in the land where she was bred. A guardian of the country, she was always there. Like that tripper that was molded on the Morris Depot Square. Come ye troopers of old, wherever ye may be, drink a century toast. To the BSAP, and we'll sing a couple of bars of the good old Kamakai song. To the BSAP, and the regiment lives on. Old Black Boots may march on, reservists may grow old, and part who might have done their very last patrol, last body on his beat, last airman in the sky. Lost B girl on the radio, the legend cannot die. Come ye troopers of old, wherever ye may be, drink a century toast to the BSAP, and we'll sing a couple of bars of the good old Kamakai song to the BSAP, and the regiment lives on. The outposts of the world, the regiment lives on in the land of the silver fern, Australia and Hong Kong, in Britain's misty isles, beneath the American skies, in Africa, her birthplace, the spirit never dies. Come ye troopers of old, wherever ye may be, drink a century toast. To the BSAP, and we'll sing a couple of bars of the good old Kamakai song. To the BSAP, and the regiment lives on. To the BSAP, and the regiment lives on. Uh, it's my great privilege to have Mike Norton uh, with us today. Um, Mike has given a couple of talks before about his uh, time in Special Branch, mainly about Op Enterprise. This time, Mike's going to tell us a little bit more about his background and how he ended up in Special Branch and leading up to that. So, Mike, over to you, brother. Morning, John, and morning, morning, viewers and listeners. Um, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to to sort of maybe round off my my, my story. Um, I, I was born in Zambia um, and emigrated to Rhodesia in 19, 1970. My parents were farmers and my father had an engineering business, but when Zambia turned that, that sort of went to, into ruins in, the, in, the, in 1970, we moved down to what was then obviously Rhodesia. Um, obviously, having a bit of a background in, in, in farming, I looked at Gweebe Agricultural College, which I'd like to mention. Now, Gweebe Agricultural College was one of the three prominent and most famous agricultural colleges in the world, along with Siren Sester in England and Sadara in Natal. And we often got foreign students um, from abroad to Gwibi. Now, Gwibi courses weren't, weren't big. They were, we were about 28 or 30. Um, and what I had to do first is do what they call pre-Gwibi training. So I went to my cousin out in Mbukwis um, and did uh, the early part of, of the early part of 1970 up until October with, with, with him. And um, it was very interesting. Book was new to me, but they had a pub and a, and a rugby team, which was very important. And that helped me slot in a lot to, to, that, to that place. Um, great people, great district. 
um, and had a lot of a lot of a lot of fun and games in, in, in that part of the world. Then it came to going to Guibi itself. Um, the most interesting thing about going to Guibi was the first week. Guibi had a fast initiation process, which I guess helped when we came to all the other processes we had to go through. It was one week where you spent your time in your underpants and a pair of gumboots. You slept on the roof. When you were sleeping on the roof, the, ne- the senior course to you would walk along with a, with a plume handle and run across the corrugations. So you didn't really sleep at all. And that went on you know, for the whole time. Eventually, you got so exhausted, you did sleep. Um, you were chased around all over the place in your underpants and gumboots, normally with your gumboots full with water. And then you had to drink the water out the gumboots. It was, it was quite, quite an episode, I can promise you. Um, obviously, towards the end of the week, it, it, it eased off. Um, punishment for doing something stupid was to put your tongue out and get it sprayed with aloe, with crushed aloe. And you can, know, you can, you can imagine what that made your mouth, mouth feel, feel like. Um, obviously, we had meals as normal and all the rest of it. It was just a, it was just a, a very interesting process um, that we, we repeated on our junior course the, the, the next year. But um, anyway, all fun and games. So the uh, last night of the of the pass out of the um, um, what they call initiation, we had a fierce party and everyone fell down, and that was the end of it. And it never, you know, that was except you were now a fully fledged student. But I got to mention a few things. We were we were we were hooligans. We were very very mischievous. Um, and you know, when you get sixty guys that age together, the, the shenanigans are just. You know, I'll just relate one or two to you. Um, it was a time of the Pierce Commission. Remember that the, when they, they tried to get acceptance for the 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 votes, um, the way it was set up as a sort of partial rec- um, partial recognition of, of, of black voters. Um, well, it didn't go well, as you well remember, but that's not what I'm talking about. The British Embassy came back, and I think it was on the top of one of the tall buildings in Gordon, what was Gordon Avenue. And they had a, the British Union Jack flying um, for a, about a week or two when they were here. We were in town um, having a bit of a, you know, probably cock door and a few other places. When one of our guys spotted the Union Jack hanging on the flag up there. Now, you normally, as you know, flags get brought in at, at, at dusk, but something had happened. So there was a staircase um, to get up to the to the top of that thing, and, and three of our guys roared up that staircase up to the top, onto the top floor to find what the problem was. The problem was the flag rope had broken, and that's why the flag was still out there. Not to be deterred, very nimble fellow, um, course mate of mine, who subsequently unfortunately was killed. Um, climbed along the pole, grabbed the flag, paired down the stairs to be met by the BSAP. Of course, it's been noticed. So these three were hauled off to the to the to the charge office. The flag was taken, confiscated, and pl- placed under the um, charge office counter. The three miscreants were put down in the cells for maybe an hour or two, and then you know, BSAP, being sympathetic in those days, said, "Okay, you scoundrels, off you go. We know you're be students, and you're all up to nonsense." So Go, go back to Guibu and go to sleep. On the way out, Paul Crouch, who had the man who climbed the pole, saw the flag there and nobody was really watching. So he grabbed the flag, stuck it under his shirt, and headed out into the vehicles where we were waiting outstairs, outside. We drove off, but we didn't take the proper route back to Guibu because we knew. We took the back one of the back routes, the old Missouri Road, um, and ended up at Guibu and hit, put the flag in a, in, a, in a bag, plastic bag, sealed it up carefully put it on a piece of string and put it in the pig's wool tank. Nobody was going to look in the pig's wool tank. Sure enough, about five o'clock in the morning, the police arrived and, you know, all us all out and say, come on, you scoundrels, where's, where's this flag? And we said, well, you, you had it. We've gone and got it. Um, in fact, we said, we saw it, you saw it under the counter of the charge office counter. You've got to got it. No, no, I didn't believe it. So they searched everything and what eventually they gave up, realized you know, it, was, it probably wasn't really that important anyway. So we left it in there for about a in the, for about a week, and of course the Pierce Commission wrapped up the British Council or whatever it was headed off, and uh, we produced the flag, and it went up in our pub, which was next to the cricket field and the rugby field and whatever. <laughs> Lo and behold, we played cricket against police two weeks later, and in the police team were some of the guys who'd arrested, <laughs> and they took one look and they said, "We knew you had it, <laughs> we, but you're welcome to keep it." Um, so that, that was sort of shenanigans that we'd, we'd, we'd be, that we were very, as I said, very mischievous. We used to get banned from most pubs in town. The, um, Pierce, the Pierce Commission, um, Mike, that was uh, sort of 70, end 70, of November 1971, eh? Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. It was, you know, it was a short-lived thing, as you probably remember. But, um, 
anyway, we carried on. We went. We had a serious rugby team in my in my years. Um, we actually played a game against Mashonaland, um, and and narrowly lost. I think it was a three points. It was one of try and one try in those days. Uh, it didn't just happen. We had a, a bunch of very very able rugby players at that particular instance. Anyway, enough with Gweebi now. Then came now coming into Depot, which I, I did mention before. I think um, you went into the police depot. I think I went in October 71, 73, of course, 6 of 73. We were initially, um, we were uh, indicted as what you call them national service police officers. Um, and then uh, my father had a great mate who was a senior police officer. And he said, listen, guys, if I was you, I would join regular because you're in for a year now. But this is going to go up to 18 months and probably more. And he says, why don't you just do a three-year stint as a regular? You pay vastly more. You're better equipped. You'll, you'll get proper posting. You're a proper police officer. Um, and it do you no harm. It's three years where you will learn an awful lot. And 16 of us decided, yeah, again, but I think in my squad, there were eight of us from Weeby. Um, and we, we all went in as, as regulars. The, we were a small squad, 16 only because they needed to get us through and out before the big national service impacts came, came in. Um, so we were rushed through in three months. We avoided the dreaded equitation, thank goodness. Um, we didn't really feel like riding horses. And, um, but, you know, we, we got through quickly, usual training. We did a fair bit of, of coin training, funny enough, along with the law and police and all that sort of stuff. Um, we also learned why the first thing they taught you was, was, was ride control. Because when you were in depot, you were the, the, the Salisbury Riot Squad. And in my time, we only ever got called out once, which was to a football match that had gone wrong. And the, the fans had decided, right, we need to give a few people, you know, break a few stores and, you know, usual hooliganism. So we deployed on that. Um, I remember I had, a, I had a greener single shot shotgun and five routes. And uh, we deployed, I chased a few people um, in down in the in the, in the the hostels in, in, in Harare Township. There. But nothing much of it. But look, it was a, it was a, it was a learn, learning curve. Um, and then um, I guess what happened, you know, once you, we were passed out quickly and then Kate came to posting. So we were all given a choice. Where would you like to go? Three choices. And I said, Salisbury, Salisbury Urban or Salisbury Rural. Right. My posting comes, pull away. I suppose they <laughs> thought that was funny. <laughs> uh, Anyway, off we go to Bulawayo. There were three of us down, sent down to Bulawayo in various roles as, as junior patrol officers. And I ended up in the, initially in the, in the charge office in Bulawayo, which is always a good place to learn because you get all sorts of things coming in there and it teaches you the admin process and how to set up dockets and all that, all that which always you'd learned in depot, but in practice it's a bit different. But then um, I remember doing a little bit of beat work, which really wasn't done much in those days. Um, it was mainly um, because... Um, that patrolled and went to the different areas. And then, you know, there were lots of st satellite stations in the townships and, and hillside and whatever. So that, you know, it was quite spread out for police work. But Bulo wasn't the most exciting you know, crime capital of the world. Um, and I managed to get myself a stint in the, as the control room uh, controller, controlling all the vehicle traffic, B cars, all the rest of it. Um, because the guy who was on duty was actually, was actually still. Anyway, I obviously did a reasonable job there, and they, they, I became the, the, the duty controller. Um, that was much more interesting because, you know, I was whatever was happening, I knew exactly what was happening. And, you know, I had to, had to then coordinate with the senior officers if the event, if it was a murder or a, or a bad incident, I had to make sure they knew about it and that I could dispatch um, VCAS uh, VIC to the scene and personnel. And so that became, yeah, pretty, pretty interesting, and I enjoyed that. And then also... When I wasn't on, on shift, I could actually ride the B cars as well. I wasn't a driver. I didn't qualify as a driver. But um, you ride as, a, as the observer the B cars, which made life you know, quite interesting. We did get up to mischief, of course, when it was a really boring you know, evening. We'd go out to hillside dams there and then try and shoot rabbits and then try and disguise the reason we'd have a, you know, a shot speed fired. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we didn't. We did. Mischief was, was, it kept you, kept, you, you know, kept you going with that sort of stuff. I did my first part two call up from Bulawayo to um, Mount Down. And um, it was when an incursion had happened of a small group, I think, had come through from the Zipalilo area and were heading down towards Mtori Um Those days, it was the, the old method of sweep, long lines of people sweeping. And, you know, and of course, we made so much of a racket that anyone would have, would have heard us coming for miles. So it was still rudimentary days of. of you know, as far as I could work at the party patrolling. Um, 
John, one thing I forgot to mention about my BB course, um, eight of my course were killed during the war. Gosh. Being obviously double double danger, being farmers and um, part-time police reserve soldiers, army, whatever. So it was quite a quite a, a large percentage. And one of them was Paul Crouch, the guy of, 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 of Royal Union Jack Flame. And uh, he was killed not far from his farm in Rafa Wurr um, in about 74, 75. Anyway, uh, Party Patrol over with. Um, I was then sent on a, a, a tracking course to Gokwi. We know that was Gokwi was a, was a quiet area, so it was quite safe to do a tracking course there. And um, yeah, it was good fun. It was good. I, I was never going to be a, a huge tracker, but I did reasonably well and got a sort of, uh, okay, you passed um, on that thing, which, which, you know, look, it taught you bits about things about the bush and um, all, that, all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> we went by train up to, to Kwekwe and then to Gokwi by truck. Anyway, on the way back, a couple of us got a bit bored and went to the Redcliffe pub and got uh, a little bit um, inebriated. So we missed the train. Anyway, a friendly guy from Redcliffe drove us uh, back, caught up with the train and got on. Well, the guy in charge of the tracking course was a, a particularly popular fellow. Um, and he was a bit sort of aggressive. And, you know, he was, he was not, not a very pleasant chap. And nobody really liked him, but he was a good tracker. You know, he, he, as we got on the train, we obviously had been a bit wobbly. He berated us and all the rest of it, and then he pushed me, which I found was completely unnecessary. So I smacked him. Now, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not supposed to be done. So when I woke up the next morning, there we are, um, in Bulua, I'm promptly put on a charge for striking a superior officer. Um, and I'm sent to, I'm sent to barracks, depot, to sit, sit and wait for the, my, my, uh, my hearing dates, two, two days hence or whatever. Anyway, I got a, one of my, my friends was a section officer, and he said, I'll defend you. And he, he came up with the most innovative um, defense. He said, just been on a hectic tracking course. Of course, the, the, the officer, you know, the, the, the chief superintendent trying me, um, I have no clue what it was like in the bush. So he laid it on thick. These guys have been in the bush. They've been all over. The anyway, his grandmother's not very well either. So he's a bit hit up. I got a $10 fine. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, I actually got um, bought quite a lot of beers because most people reckon that that fellow needed a slap. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I was well, going because... to ask you: Was it a BSAP guy doing the course, or was it yes. a oh, okay. B BSAP guy? No, BSAP guy. He was a uh, yeah, one of the old timers, sticklers from way back. <laughs> so uh, anyway, yeah. well, subsequent to that, um, I was given a nudge that uh, maybe I should sort of uh, transfer, and a, and a transfer came up in, Bing in for Binga. Now I'd grown up on the other side of the lake at Choma, which is only. 80 kilometers from the lake, grown up in boats. My father's engineering business actually made boats and they made some for the old Operation No back in the, back in the days of, of Rupert Fothergill. Mm. So I was completely familiar with, with the lake on that side. Um, so off to, off to Bingo I went. Um, our mess was with the Air Force because they had um, two or three um, choppers in that area at the time, mainly in support of the, of the SAP, which I'll, I'll tell you more about as we went, but they were in that, in that particular area. Um, the member in charge was, was ex Rhodesian rugby player Tom Nordi, big man, um, a good, but a great guy. He was he was firm but but very very um, fair, um, great sense of humour, and he motivated the, you know us to, to do as much as we possibly can. His two IC, whose name I won't mention because he's still around, um, was a, a, a horizontally challenged individual um, who was very bitter and twisted. He was English. And I don't know why he came out to join the BSAP. He just was completely unsuited. Anyway, he did my boat license or whatever and had to grumpily award it to me because I'd driven boats since I was about six. Um, and he just made, you know, he just trying to make life difficult um, for everybody there. So just a bit of history about him. After I'd actually moved on from Bingo, um, hunters in that area in those days used to come and lodge all their uh, belongings, their US dollars, uh, traveler's checks, all that stuff in the police, um, walk in safe, the big, the big uh, strong room. That was quite normal activity to be done. Tom Nordi was away, and this fellow was in charge, obviously. A particular big hunting group came along, and they deposited a lot of dollars and all sorts of things into the safe and went off on the hunting trip. Um, I was, I think, on a lake patrol at that particular point. Um, I came back. Tom came, Tom came back, and I think he called me on the radio and said, have you got SO whatever with you? I said, no. So he said, well, he's not here. So I said, well, I don't know where he is. So he said, well, please come back. Um, we need to sort this out. 
So we, we went, I went back. It took me about an hour and a half to get back from wherever I was. And he said, this is, this is, this is something really serious here now. He said, apparently, according to the, to the, the staff, the, the um, African constables and sergeants, he, Stessa had gone off in the Land Rover two days before and not returned. So we thought, okay, we better, we better now start. Something's happened here. Um, when we got, Tom got a phone call from uh, CID headquarters saying, are you looking for SO so-and-so? And he says, yes. Well, he left the country on the flight uh, last night and had, went to, had a ticket to Johannesburg. We've checked with Johannesburg and he's, he's, he's flown to the UK. He'd nicked the lot. It was extraordinary. I mean, that was very uncommon in the BSAP. Um, in fact, almost unheard of, but he did it. Oh. He did that and um, never caught, obviously, because, you know, and he must have got away and said himself, mentioned that too much. <laughs> anyway, um, Binga, um, what we called it, we called them big ears. It was Zulu Troop, the South African um, listening device, radio listening. We're posted right outside there on the edge of the lake, right in front of where our, where, where our mess was. And they were monitoring um, military traffic from Zambia, Angola, obviously for their own ends as well, uh, Southwest Africa as it was then. And um, they sort of rotated through in, in monthly batches and collected all that information, sent it back. It was obviously useful to them as well as being as well as being useful to us. And then we had four SAP camps situated all the way down the lake in various various places where there was a, probably a, a company of SAP um, stations. And one of my jobs was to, was to go to each of those um, stations, meet, meet up with the SAP, brief them as what was going on, sometimes by water, sometimes by, by road, sometimes by air, um, and generally spend a couple of days with them trying to help them get settled and, and, and get used to the, to the bush and, and all the rest of it. Um, it was a pleasure because they were extraordinarily well looked after, soft beds, excellent catering, cold beer in the camp, and quite often um, a, a donkey would set off their quite elaborate alarm systems outside the, the, the camp, and about 2,000 rounds would be fired off with a sport donkey, and uh, that was considered practice. So we, we were liberally supplied with, with items from the from their camp, I and mean, we, we, we scrounged all sorts of very, very good things. Um, so it made, made life quite a, quite a sort of pleasure there. Trolling the lake was always fun. Um, we had, in those days, 19-foot boats with um, 120 horsepower Volvo Penters in them. A bit sluggish, but they were, they were good in rough weather. Um, and I would take patrols all the way up to Boomi Hills, all the way down to Malabisi, and then sometimes through the gorge, um, Devil's Gorge, all the way down to Sibinkwazi and, and um, what's the other place down the other end there? Msuna, where officially the lake ends. Those, those, were, those, were, those were also good fun and good fishing. So um, life wasn't too bad in, in, in Binga. I'll tell you a story about the late Ian Harvey. He was stationed then um, in the, as one of the pilots at, at uh, Binga. And his habits, once a week we got a film. There was the Binga Hotel, which was about four kilometers away. And we would go down there, sit outside, watch this big screen, some movie, whatever, blurred, and we'll drink a few beers and come back to the thing. One day, Harves is a bit late for dropping people off, so he lands at the at the at the hotel. It was a, there was a, a good space to land there, no big problem at all. But he's landing, you know, sort of around about five, six o'clock, late last night. Um, comes and watches the movie, has a few beers, of course. His tech says to him, "So, what are you going to do with the helicopter?" No, no, I'm going to fly it back. Well, I'm not coming with you. He says, "Fine, no problem. It's just a, it's a hop up the thing here. It's no problem. I'll see you up there." So we head off, drive it, get to the mess. The helipad, there's only one helicopter, it's supposed to be two. So we get on the radio and we call and Harvey answers and says, uh, wh where are you? He says, I'm, I'm right above you, I'm landing now. He says, no, you're not. We said, no, you're not, we can't even hear you. Silence. Then we start hearing boop, boop, boop across the lake. He almost landed in Sinazongu on the Zambian side. <laughs> <laughs> and he came and landed we were rolling around laughing and he said, you know, I really wondered why I had so many black faces looking at me from the ground. <laughs> he was nearly on the ground. <laughs> you know, that was never mentioned in his lifetime. As you know, he retired as an Air Vice Marshal. Uh, old Hobbs, he was a hell of a character. So, you know, we had a lot of, we had a lot of fun in, in, in Bingo and did some work. I came across a suicide. Um, it was one of the first ones I've ever come across of this type. This, I got called by the SAP. 
went off, went to this hut, and the, the Tongas live in very, very low um, huts. But, you know, you've got to really stoop to go through the door with those elaborate doors that they have. And this guy had hung himself from the middle of, of the hut. But when I got there, he was dead, but his knees were on the ground. And I suddenly thought, hmm, this doesn't look right to me. I had a very experienced uh, sergeant with me, and he said, sir, this guy hung himself. I said, yeah, I gathered that, but was he helped? He said, no, this is what they do. They put the um, wire around their neck, in a, in a, in a, on the, while they're on their on the, on the hands and knees, they raise their legs up until they actually strangle, and only when they strangle do their knees go back down again. He says, this is the, about the fourth or fifth one I've seen. And he says, I see that you have that power of, like, like, but he said, no, that's what they do. If they really get desperate, that's what they do. And we confirmed with other people that he was suicidal. So it was a matter of a radio call to, to the local bingo magistrate. And, and he said, yes, another one. Okay, fine, write it off. Uh, don't worry about it. Well, that was extraordinary. It worried, worried be a long time that somebody could actually do that, you know, consciously. Anyway, that was, you know, it was just a, an, an aside on the whole thing. Anyway, I went back on some time off. Um, and at the police club, I bumped into a guy who was to be a uh, big influence in my life all the, from, from there on, uh, uh, then Superintendent Danny Stannard of the Special Branch. And, you know, we, Danny was a very good cricketer and, you know, we sort of crossed paths and that sort of thing as well. Um, and he said to me one day, he said, how are you doing in bingo? I said, no, it's great. No, it's, it's great. It's, it's, um, he said, well, listen, I'd really like you to, to make a transfer to Mtoko. So I said, okay, I, well, sure, it's up to you. You, 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 must, you know, tell whoever needs um, to transfer me. Um, but why? He said, well, things are going to start happening in that area. Um, and I'd like you, I'd like you there. I said, okay, well then organize my, my transfer. I went back to Binga, collected all my bits and pieces, said cheers to everybody, and then transferred to, to Mtoko. Um, those days, the, the, there'd been one incident. It was a, a small incursion up by Baya Baya Beacon, um, on the Mzoe River, which a, a small group had come in there and they'd been, um, eliminated. But, um, Mtoko was setting itself up to be a jock. It no, you know, we had Centenary at that point. We had uh, Mount Darwin, but no jock in the in the east as such. So when I got there, the, the, the jock was being set up, and the air force was moving in. And the, in those days, it was the old grass airstrip, um, very close to the town. So you know, I came along as usual, hurry up and wait thing. So while I was waiting, you know, doing normal police duties and whatever, and um, while I was while I was um, waiting for things to happen and whatever, um, obviously I was doing normal normal. Duties and investigating a, 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 a house. It wasn't a robbery; it was a housebreaking and theft of one of the houses in Tokyo. And we we had information on the guy who lived in the Ngarawe TTL there, which is you go up the road to Kotwe and then in towards Morosi Dam. Um, and we found the guy's ball and whatever went in, and there was all the, the the stolen clothing and everything on the line, having been washed and whatever. And no problem at all. The guy was asleep in the hut, so we we, we bumbered him, and he said, "Yeah, okay, fine, yeah." And we took all the evidence. Then I found a hut. It was wired shut. Um, and I said to my sergeant, is he not hiding something in there? He says, boss, you, you, don't, you don't want to know. Leave it alone. Leave that alone. That's the, this is the, cro the crawl's problem. Don't, don't interfere there, please. I said, no, no. being a, you know, pretty ignorant in those days, I said, no, no, I can't accept that. I need to see what's in the hut. So the crawl head came along and reluctantly undid the, 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 um, the wire, all wired up. Um, and I was standing right with the, with the doors. Next thing, the door flew open, and this this bag of rags came hurtling out. Um, basically, ran me over um, and headed off into the into into the bush. You know, I was I stood there, with, I was a bit shocked, and I said, "What the hell is that?" He says, "That's the local madman. Now you've let him go. Now they've got to go and catch him again." Now you remember from your time in the earlier days, John, particularly if you talk this area. Most crawls had the sort of the local loony who was either sort of fairly mild or in this case, this guy obviously was, was violent and, you know, in, se in severe dementia or whatever. And how they, unfortunately, most of them, because they didn't stop or, or, or uh, heed any calls for, you know, to halt or whatever. Well, a lot of them got shot um, in that particular area. And this was, this was this guy. I don't know whether they ever captured this guy again, but um, that taught me a, a big, big lesson about and how strong he was. I mean, I'm not small, and he just flattened me. Um, well, I tell you what, I couldn't stop my sergeant laughing. <laughs> he thought that he said, I told you. So anyway, we, 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 learned, we learned a bit there. Anyway, on to changing things now. Um, 
Danny then came up and became the special branch officer for Mtoko Jock in the early days then. And um, the special branch guy in Yamapanda uh, was, was uh, Les Lloyd. Um, well, Les had been there for some quite some time. And remember, this is the time when um, Portuguese had Portuguese coup had happened and things were terribly uncertain in Mozambique. And constantly we were seeing Portuguese uh, people leaving Mozambique and coming across. Um, I, I understand, don't quote me, but the Air Force guys will be able to, I, I believe some of them actually flew uh, some islanders and some helicopters across um, and handed them over to the Rhodesian, Rhodesian forces. Um, I, didn't, I didn't see that with my own eyes, but you know, I, heard, I heard about it. But we certainly saw a lot of Portuguese families and ex-Portuguese soldiers and a lot of the, what are they called? PIDE, the Portuguese Secret Police. They, a lot of them came across um, and subsequently quite a few joined the Rhodesian forces. Um, I'm sure you probably had a couple in the RLA. Um, anyway, an, an, an insurgent um, presence was detected in the Ngarui TTL in the area of Morosi Dam, which is, if you go on the Nyamapanda Road, it's north um, of Kotwe. So we were assembled and told, right, head off, you guys head off to um, um, Morosi Dam and set up a base there in the, in the, in the DC's um, rest camp. There were, I think, 10 of us, a couple of vehicles. Um, and our job there was to provide a coordination for um, that area, try and find out what, you know, who, who was there, who moved in, any new information or whatever. So I guess it was my start on the ground coverage role. Um, though we, we, we operated in, in, um, in camouflage uniforms um, and uh, patrolled that area for quite extensively. The detective set up quite a good source um, in the Morosi Dam store um, in the beer hall there where they'd want, they'd go up and have a few drinks and whatever. And they picked up, yes, he said, there is something around. There's no question there's a group here. Um, it's a recce group. They're not going to take offensive action, apparently, but they're just sussing out the area to see who's just, you know, who, who would be um, sympathetic to the insurgents and all that kind of stuff. Well, we obviously sent our reports back, you know, daily in the evening on, on Shackle and the Scrambled Radio. Um, and as I say, John, this is early days of the war. The next thing morning, we were advised that a company of RAR are coming to us. So we said, fine, uh, but what are they going to do? They're going to sweep the whole area. So Les and I, we, and we, we sent a signal back saying, look, we're just trying to build a picture on these guys. We, we don't know really where they are. So to send us a, a, a company out here to sweep the area is going to ruin every bit of work that we've been doing, trying to establish the presence um, and try and find out where they are so we can actually be effective, strike, you know, be, do something pretty good. And you send the slot out. Well, the brigadier, uh, uh, he, was, he was actually the, the RAR guy was in charge of the jock, not having any of it. Out came the the, um, the 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 whole company, and they swept the area backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And as expected, found absolutely nothing. So then we had to start again um, because these guys obviously moved off, and now we had a whole new uh, story. Anyway, about three days later, um, early in the morning, um, two of the detective sergeants, yes, they were going to go and try and find out from the guy at the store if there's any more news. And they drove up the road from Rossi Dam towards the store, and um, big bang, there we go, our first landmine. Luckily, rear wheel detonation. Um, so when we got there, they, you know, they were just a bit stunned and all the rest of it. Um, but obviously, they, they, these guys have decided now to take a bit of a bit of offensive action. So the fire force actually was moved to the Ngarui uh, DC camp, which is a bit north of Rossi Dam, and it may well have been a, been a view. It's on the border edge of Fungwe. Um, set up there to be a bit closer to to the the action where we were, and um, about a week later, a, we had a visit from people I'd never heard of at that point, uh, the scouts, who said, "Look, we are going to go and freeze this area because we've you know you guys have come up with some pretty good info, um, and we'd like you to to just keep going, doing what you're doing, stick the roads, um, and we're going to infiltrate and try and establish where they are." Well, that was all new to us, but. Um, I think Les knew about it, but you know we were we were a bit greener than that in those days. Um, you know they came, they froze the area. We continued our normal sort of duties and activities. And I remember one morning, I can't remember the day, whatever, just um, at about ten o'clock, the fire force from uh, the the Ngari, Ngari, um, DC's camp area actually came into the area about fifteen kilometres uh, north of us, and a contact did ensue there. We we followed up uh, in the vehicles there and met up with the the land tail. Uh, with the drums of fuel and all the rest of it. And as far as I remember, seven or eight um, 
insurgents were killed and, and two two were captured. And we we got the captured, took them off into into um, back to Morassi Dam, and Les got going, you know, interrogating them to find out what the story was. It was a group of twenty eight that had come in, and that they had um, the recce group had gone out, and the other twenty eight had come in, and that's why hence the land bomb. Um, and you know they were not doing more offensive action anyway. That that blunted that that one. Um, and I think they, the, the, the remnants just disappeared back into back into Mozambique, which is only about, as you know, Mozambique's only about 50, 40, 50 k's away from there. Um, so we were wrapped up um, at Morosi Dam and said off back to back to um, Matoka, where we're going to form what the, what then became the the uh, teams. We became Team Alpha, and basically we were a ground coverage stroke special branch. Um, investigative unit and information gathering unit. And we were posted to the little roads camp at Kotwa, which is on the road to Nyamapanda, about halfway between Motoko and, um, and Nyamapanda, on the flatland there. Um, and our, our role became primarily then um, intelligence gathering in that area. Um, there was myself, a guy called um, Gavin, Gavin Hilton Downing Rabi, who was known as Yeti. Um, because he looked exactly like the abominable snow oak. <laughs> so, <laughs> in a, he and I shared duties north and south of the of the of the road and establishing sources and and things like that. And we started to get quite you know we still people were still quite cooperative in those days, but the war hadn't really reached that area in any big way. Um, but just one thing, I'm just, <laughs> just the scouts had asked, unbeknown to me, um, for a, a, a pseudo ambush to be set up so that they could verify themselves in that Morosi Dam area. And it fell to, I can't remember if it was Les or somebody else, um, to drive a Land Rover through there. And, and he would get ambushed, so to speak, by these by the scouts to try and give himself a bit of gravitas. Whoever it was thought, no, let's liven things up a bit. And he took some grenades with him. And as they sort of got shot at, um, you know, all around and up and up in the sky, he pulled the pin on a grenade and, and threw it out of the, of the driver's door. Most Land Rovers, as you remember, all had a roll bar on. The grenade hit the roll bar and landed in the back of the of the Land Rover. Well, I subsequently met some of the scouts guys later, and they said it was the funniest. Thing. They've never seen anybody debust from a Land Rover as fast as that, with the vehicle still going. Anyway, the grenade exploded and did quite a bit of damage. You know, luckily the back of the Land Rover has got that um, conveyor belting, so it was still drivable, but quite quite tattered. And then um, I then saw the vehicle later at uh, at um, Yamapanda where a new member in charge had, had, had moved in there, who was a stickler for the book. He was an ex-submariner. And I think it's going to tell you something about submariners. Um, his, we used to call him simply putrid, because he was that's basically what he was. Well, you can imagine the reports that had to be written to his Land Rover that they'd borrowed. Oh, so we just need to borrow this Land Rover to go up the road, and he comes back peppered. So uh, anyway, that's just one of, the, one of the stupid things that went on in those days. You know, Katwa, look, when um, we'd been in Katwa about two or three months, I think, and started to get some good information coming in. Um, there was a, a major group coming in north of the road, coming in through the old route from um, Bear Bear Beacon on the, on the Mazoe River um, into, that, into that particular area. Fire Force then moved to Matoka. Um, the, the old uh, the entire tar airstrip was, no, that was a thing of the, of the future. So it was all on the, on the football field. Um, Right next to where we we were in, like Nissen huts, which were old roads roads camp, though. and a fire force of five helicopters came and landed there with the troops and, and all, all the rest of it. Um, maybe I don't know if you were in that one. It could well have been. I think I, it was definitely. I was, I was there. Yeah, <laughs> it was yeah, us three yeah. commander. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think, and then we also had ten R R there um, from Bulawayo. Right, they were providing the sort of more you know the ground based OPs and, and and stuff like that, and. I'm just looking. I was looking back on my notes. I mean, we we had a fair bit of of success there over that over that last. Uh, it was about six months of activity in that area, um, mostly north of the road. Funny enough, um, that seemed to be where the the concentration of of the of the insurgents was. And um, in Pete Simmons's um, incident, uh, when he's talked to you, he mentioned a lot about that. That's where he got his PCR um, when he was shot um, and wounded. Twice in that in the on that fire force action, um, we also had I forget who it was now another pilot. Oh yes, he was a South African uh, pilot. Those remember those days we had quite a lot of South African G car pilots, and from a 
quite a successful contact. He came in and he decided to do a little bit of a beta on the um, on the football field. And he forgot about the football posts that were made of Mapani tree. He clipped one with one of his blades. And I tell you what, Pete was with me, standing with me. And we all went, oh, God. he nearly hit us because he lost control of the aircraft completely and just had to throw it onto the ground. Um, luckily, none of the other aircraft were damaged. But I tell you what, flying bits and pieces. Pete and I ducked into the, the sandbag um, sort of um, defenses there. It was, it was quite a close thing. And Pete didn't mention it out of... Um, you know, sort of respect for the South African guy, but I thought it was, you know, just a little, <laughs> you had to be a little bit careful with those things. You couldn't just go and run around and chop down poles. <laughs> anyway, that, that's obviously was shipped out and that whole thing disappeared and we got a, we got another aircraft. Um, but yeah, there was, um, I remember uh, Tenor having some quite big contacts over successive days um, in that um, Garwe TTL running, and, and in fact, running into Fungui as well, which is what, probably why you would have ended up in that particular area. Um, and then, of course, came the, the time of the um, detente, if you remember that one. When I'm just looking at the date. Yeah, that was 75, early 75. Yeah. When the state, remember detente and everyone, we weren't allowed to do anything unless they were entering the country. Or, you know, we, we had great difficulty working out who was going which way. Um, but basically, they gave the insurgents a complete breathing space. Um, as you will remember, and things went terribly quiet. Most of them did leave the country. Uh, the Herbert Shungu incident happened in that time um, on the Missouri Low Level Bridge, when a SAP patrol, with uh, four of them with a with a, a, a BSAP constable, uh, were approached by Herbert Shungu on the on on the bridge and on the on the, on the basis of detente. He, he sent a message saying, "Look, you know, we're we're, we're detente now. We're not going to shoot at each other. Um, please, would you come across and we need to talk and whatever." So that unfortunately, the SAP being really you know fairly naive at that point, came started walking across the bridge. The police constable, uh, the BSAP police constable, realized that something was afoot here, and he dived off the bridge into the river and swam. These four policemen were mown down by Herbert Schumann. Um And, you know, that, that, that really, I think that showed whoever was negotiating on this whole thing that the whole, it was an absolute farce. And um, it, it's, you know, completely unnecessary and counterproductive and, and reduced the effectiveness. If I, you know, Les Lloyd had moved on by then, and, and Harry Naismith had taken over in Yamapanda as the SB uh, rep there. And he told me, he said, I think we, we, we'd basically beaten the buggers. And they, they were, you know, they were, this gave them the breathing space to go and regroup and then get organized to come, come back in again, um, which was a great political mistake for whatever reason. Um, okay, I carried on Kotwa. Um, we had been there quite a, quite a while. Um, and then it was early 76, yes. I got the the, the the news that I was I was due for a transfer. I mean, I'd been there close to eighteen months, and I think I was going a bit funny in the head. Um, so they said, "Okay, go back to Nyamapanda, Wait, just wait a bit of time there, and uh, we'll we'll notify you about an additional posting." So I went back to Nyamapanda and try not to get involved in any boring administrative duties. Simply, Putrid was still the member in charge, so I just tried to avoid him and and do you know do what I, what I could what I felt like doing. Um, then one Sunday, um, Harry was away on time off, and a support unit stick was sweeping the, the, the road running along the minefield um, on the south of the of Yamapanda. Towards that um, that big hill, um, what's it called? I can't remember the name now. It was always used for a, for a relay. It was about 15 kilometers south of Yamapanda. Um, actually, it was slightly in Mozambique, but it, it was fine. You, you, could, you could get up there and have a decent relay. They reported a crossing of a big group. They estimated 60 to 70 strong. Uh, Harry was away. Um, Jock Matoko immediately sent a message for me to go and join up with Tenora um, and go down towards Chizwiti, which is in the south. It was then a, 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 an, again, a DC station in the south. And I went down there and met up with Major Sher and the same Tenora guys we'd had at, at Kotra. Um, those were very good soldiers, those guys. Those Bulawayo guys were very aggressive and, and, and whatever. And they had their own trackers and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, they got onto the score. And confirmed, yes, there was about 60. But the group had split into two. Uh, one had gone sort of south towards the southern part of Matogo farming area. The other one was going north, um, continuing like they were going to cross the road and go, into the, go up to Fungui, Muramba, that, that type of area. Um, they put trackers on both, both spur. And about three hours later, the southern group um, was contacted. 
at that point, uh, all the choppers were on external. I forget which external it was, one of the SAS ones. Um, so we didn't have any 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 air power. We had a Lynx, um, not sorry, a Lynx, not a, a, a no data Trojan, and the you know, Trojans were unarmed. They were only useful for for toward uh, radio communications and stuff like that. Anyway, um, um, ten R did very well, and I think they got six or seven in that first contact, including one capture who shot through the mouth. Luckily, done no damage. Just his cheeks were, were were must have been shouting at the time. Um, Anyway, I got hold of him and sat him down and confirmed that there were actually there were 28 um, surgeons and the rest were porters, and they were portering a lot of equipment, um, and they were mainly mines, mortars. Um, I couldn't establish there were any recorders rifles at that particular point, but it was it was mainly equipment um, to be cached in the in the in the different areas. He was a only a cadre, so he wasn't sure you know where where it was going, but we had a general direction. In the afternoon, the trackers contacted the northern group. Um, and killed three or four, I think. Um, and those guys took off, leaving quite a bit of equipment behind. Um, I think that's where the porter party where he was, which was with those guys, um, which makes sense, going up to that particular area. Um, so we recovered boxes of landmines, lots of ammunition, uh, 60 mil mortars. Um, we had to go into the bush with my Land Rover then collect them and bring them back. And the next morning, the fire force was then available again. And they did follow-ups on the, on the whole thing. And then she, once they got into the... Um, Beyond the Matoka, sort of beyond Kotwa's area of influence, um, I, I lost, obviously, there were many contacts I heard of, but um, I didn't necessarily end up involved in that at all. Because at that point, I'd been told where my new posting was going to be, and that was going to be Beatrice, south of Salisbury, farming area, Afrikaans in the south, English in the north, um, but a, a, bit of, a, great, a great place. Um, I came back to um, Yamapanda at a, at a serious farewell there. Um, because I'd been so long. The, our pub there was called the Gastric Ulcer, because it created many, many gastric ulcers, I can assure you. Um, anyway, I had that packed up from there, and that was that, that practice of, uh, chapter of my life over. I moved to Beatrice. This was a completely different story now. This was a, untouched at that point by the war. Um, I was nominally back in, in, in uniform, um, but only for a very short time. Uh, Inspector Pete Hamilton, who was the member in charge then, realized that Things were going to warm up, and you know we, the Beatrice wouldn't escape the, the tentacles of the war for very much longer. Um, so he said, "Right, I want you to revert to a GC role, uh, which you, you know you know well. Um, get out of uniform, get into a, um, an unmarked vehicle, and get around." Well, initially it did alarm the farmers a little because all of a sudden they'd seen me in a uniform. Now all of a sudden I wasn't. Um, but you know I've explained to them, "Look, we've got to we've got to try and make sure that you know things are on the ground are, are covered." But in the meantime, I, I really enjoyed Beatrice. Um, again, it had a fierce rugby team, which I joined. Very good pub, country club. Um, very good people. Um, I mean, we had the, the sort of rugby team was half English, half Afrikaans. Um, because that southern area of, of the going to Featherston was full of you know, all the Afrikaans em immigrants who'd come there in the 1930s. What position uh, great did you people. play, Mike? Were you a lock? Well, I, no, I was a fullback. Okay. Fullback and wing. Okay, wow. Well. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. so no, I could, I could actually, I could motor a bit in those so days. You were quite fast, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was quite fast. I think I was, you know, one of the first sort of big wings, as they called them. Uh, I took a bit of tackling, <laughs> but uh, no, it was great fun. Now we had, and then we, used to, then we went back to Mbukwe's for the annual Mbukwe's Rugby Festival, um, which Beatrice we won that year, um, and that was, uh, you know, that, I remember that festival went on for years and years and years. Great fun, great fun. Off the subject, did. Um, um, what school did you go to, just by the way? I went to Dale College in South Africa. Okay. Did you ever, in Mbukwe's, when I was, in, when I was at, at Plumtree School, we had um, the Hamilton family. and the, yes. Did you meet the Hamiltons? Yeah, yes, oh, very much. In Mbukwe's, so. okay. Just yes. started very prominent family there. Yeah, J.G. Um, J. J. Hamilton, I remember. Tall, yeah. lanky guy. Yeah. yeah, lanky guy, yeah. J.J. used to call him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and his so best friend was a was a short little blonde-haired guy, a uh, Cooper. We call him Scops, you know, like because a Scops owl is so small. Yes. So his yeah. nickname was Scops Cooper. Yeah, Cooper and Hamilton, they were an inseparable sort of Laurel and Hardy pair, you know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, I remember they they played um, they played cricket for Mbukwe's as well um, back in the day when I was you know in and around Mbukwe's. Yeah, no, those were great, those were great. But Beatrice, Beatrice was 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 great fun. You know, it was also you know so close to. To Salisbury, you know, you could pop in for a movie, and you know that, yeah. that kind of thing. So, you know, was 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 good fun. Um, then I obviously my time was coming up, 
um, to do my three years. And um, in fact, the the OC um, manpower of the police in those days was my father's friend. Um, and he actually gave me a shout and said, look, we've got to talk about your future and, and all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, look, um, I need to think about it, but I'm, you know, I've got a diploma and, you know, many people have approached me about a farming farming job and all that sort of thing, which obviously is going to be better paid than a, than, than a being a policeman and all that kind of stuff. So I said, I'll let me think about it. Um, at the same time, um, again, I bumped into Danny Stanard and he said to me, um, what are you going to do? So I said, hey, I'm anchoring towards going farming and stuff like that. He said, well, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll invite you into special branch as a reservist. You'll, you won't have any, it won't be, make any difference. You'll still continue with your, um, you know, the your sort of activities, but you'll be posted as a special branch officer to various, various areas. Um, once you, once you leave the police formally in a couple of weeks time. I said, okay, thank you very much. That's, you know, it's been, at least I knew where my call-ups were going to be and they were going to be not boring, they're going to be meaningful. Um, and as you remember from my other talks, I particularly, I, I just about became a regular because um, I was called up, you know, I was in, on call-up so often particularly with the enterprise, I just never never did any farming. But I did initially in the, in, fa in fact, my last day of, of being in the, in the regular police, um, a farmer from Salisbury South phoned very politely at seven o'clock, phoned the charge office and said, my cook tells me there were some men with guns in the compound last night. Well, I was completely stunned, as you will imagine. I said, okay, thank you. Is your cook there? He said, yes. So I said, well, keep him there. Don't let him go anywhere. I jumped in my vehicle and and went out um, in order to try and sort of deflect the saucer. But I stopped at another farm first, um, and then drove onto this guy. Um, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, um, met up with with the, with the cook who sat down and told me. Yes, he said last night they came in at about ten o'clock. Work work the people up. Said they wanted food. Um, I said how many were there? He says Eesh. I saw about ten or twelve. But he said, I think there were more in the bush. So I said, and, and did they have guns? Oh, yeah. yeah. He says, they had the thing with a funny curved magazine. I mean, and a pamphlet had gone over, all over Rhodesia in those days saying rewards on, on, uh, for weapons. So they knew what these things were. And I said, well, did they tell you anything where they were going? No. He said, no. He said, the only thing I know is when they left, they went west um, towards the, the main Beatrice um, Harari Road. I got onto. Um, Pete Hamilton and said, "This is this is the story. Um, as far as I'm concerned, with my experience, this is verified. Um, it, what he's, he's telling me is exactly what I learned, uh, you know, when we were, when I was at Cotwell and all that kind of stuff. So I, I've, I've got to believe it. So please, can you organise um, some trackers and some troops? We need to get onto this right away." He phoned me back an hour later. He says, "Swordbury don't believe you." I said, "Sorry, they don't believe you." I said, well, okay, so we're going to do that. And he said, now they're sending us SB guy out to verify what you say. So about another half an hour later, um, special branch guy arrived. It turned out to be Dave Anderton, who I knew extremely well from Cotwell. He'd been up there on, on the rotation, whatever. He took one look at me and said, oh, it's you. And um, asked to use the farmer's phone, phoned um, T-Desk and said, get people here now. This is absolutely true. He spoke to the cook as well, obviously. And, and, said, and the guy told him the same story. Well, it took about two hours for a support unit to get to um, Harare South Country Club. Base up there, come down. I said to them, don't waste your time coming here. Go to the, the, the Beatrice Road and sweep Beatrice Road in the area. This farm was about four k's from the Beatrice Road. Sweep there, and you're going to find tracks. So off they went. Sure enough, they picked up the tracks almost immediately. They headed towards the, the, the Muda purchase area, which is towards... Um, uh, the the area where, where Mugabe came from, that uh, tribal trust land there. Um, so, you know, there was no question. And the tracker said, no, this is definitely spur. Uh, I think in about, off they'd done about four or five Ks, they picked up a, an AK round. So that verified the whole whole thing, situation. So, of course, then things really spooled up. And I was told to head up to um, Salisbury South uh, Country Club and set up there where uh, they'd send me some help from, from SV. And they were going to try and get more support unit troops there and all the rest of it. So we spent the next three, four days um, at Harare South Country Club. I actually retired from the police on that Friday that the, 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 of the following week. But I was still I immediately transferred over into, into SB and carried on as, as, as normal. Much to the annoyance of the, the farmer who'd offered me a job, 
that he expected me to start on that particular day. So anyway, that was one of those things. That op went on for about another week, um, and we never ever contacted the group, but we did establish that they had ported um, munitions, um, landmines, and explosives. Their intention was to to try and blow up um, Black Macrowan. That was the, the the plan that they were they were given. The plan that we picked up. We we got hold of a, a contact man, and eventually he, he turned and said, "Okay, this is what the story is." But he says you disrupted them because of the follow up and everything. So they've cashed all the stuff, and they've gone into the Mondoro. That's the, the tribal trust land where 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 Mugabe came from. They've gone into the Mondoro to TTL, there, and they're just lying low there. So that started off a whole another process. Um, that wasn't my area, so you know I, I backed off then. Um, but that that was that was a, a very unusual incident. Mm. Of um, of what what happened? What they and, were yep. planning to blow up the dam wall on the Hanyani River? Yep. Sure. Well, that was the you know that was what we the guy told us. It yeah, could yeah. have been yeah. something else, but I think you know when he described what they were carrying, it, it seemed to make sense. I mean, I spoke to an engineer on that, um, and he said, well, "No, he said, you know, you, you might have knocked a few bricks out, but <laughs> but you know, you can imagine if, if that had happened, John, what the morale people would have suddenly thought. My goodness." Yeah. These guys are right in in amongst us, so probably just as well that we we um, we disrupted. Then that um, John, that that was a sort of as I say, I now retired as a police a regular police officer at that particular point, um, and I, I had a I had a farming job in in Salisbury South um, initially with the with the Irvins um, Irvins Chicken Group, um, but on the far, on the farming side. But um, look, I mean, uh, I was called up probably three months after that. To go to the station where all new special branch officers goes, Mukumbura. So uh, my first two call ups were, were, were Mukumbura, and then um, you know once that once Enterprise, and you know, I then moved from from um, Irvins was a bit corporate. I then I'd moved to Enterprise as a as a, as a farm manager then, um, and that's when Enterprise started to move, and and I, I spent most of my time in Enterprise in the special branch role as I as, you, as I related in my in in, that, mm. in my my other talks. So that was, I just thought that was a bit of a sort of a road, maybe of interest to some people. How, how I got to where where I got to, and some of the things that happened along the way. Yeah, um, and you know, hopefully, made, made sure we maintained maintained our sense of humour. Very interesting prequel, Mike, to your other talks. Um, yeah, I enjoyed that. Thank you very very much. <laughs>